Hi there, I'm Brad. I'm a C7 quadriplegic injury, Asia B, living in the community of Vancouver. Uh, currently dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and some of the challenges that uh, go around that and presently living on my own too and navigating some of the extra challenges that that presents. Hi, my name is Rhonda. I am a spinal cord injury physiatrist in Vancouver, and typically I get to come alongside people who are already outpatients. Um, I see people all the way from acute injury when they're in the hospital post-op, all the way through to rehab and back into real life back at home. Uh, I am very much aware of how COVID has been affecting fear and concerns about living with a spinal cord injury and extra risks that people are facing. And uh, the goal today is to see if we can get some answers within what's available uh, out to people in general. Hi, my name's Andrea. I'm also a spinal cord injury physiatrist and I work in Vancouver. I, similar to Rhonda, I, I see patients all the way from acute injury when they're in the Vancouver General Hospital into through rehab and then into the community. So I also have the opportunity to work and to um, answer questions for people living with spinal cord injury as we go through COVID. Chris, I'd like to start out with probably a fairly simple question, but maybe uh, a big answer would be, am I at risk, higher risk of COVID having a spinal cord injury? So right now we don't seem to, we, it doesn't appear that people living with spinal cord injury are at increased risk of COVID compared to the general population. The same risk factors that are there for the general population are there for people living with spinal cord injury. So the more you're exposed to, to somebody with COVID, of course you are at risk of getting COVID, but it doesn't appear that there's an increased risk if you have spinal cord injury. I think one of the parts of the answer to that question is perhaps, am I at greater risk for complications if I get COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And that's where there are some additional vulnerabilities for people who have spinal cord injury. Um, one of those risks is the respiratory function because if you have a level of injury where you have compromise in your abdominal muscles all the way uh, higher than that, then your effectiveness of your cough is more challenging, breathing function has shifted. So there are additional concerns related to compromised respiratory function. And I guess following up on that, I'd be curious about what things I could do to limit those challenges. So I think, I mean, the biggest thing is keep, keeping up the healthy habits that uh, you probably already are following, making sure you're doing things that don't affect your, your respiratory system, so not smoking. Um, and I always talk about that means not smoking anything. There's not a smoke out there that's good for you. So um, not smoking, eating a, a healthy diet that's high in fruits and vegetables, getting regular exercise, which I know can be really hard, limiting alcohol, substance, and making sure not sleep, all the good old fashioned things that you do to take care of yourself, and staying connected to your community and to your family and friends. I think when we're talking about respiratory health in general, there are some other things to consider. So for example, if you have already been using lung volume recruitment types of strategies, uh, essentially what you're doing is you're trying to expand your airways so that you have a greater capacity to allow for efficient oxygen transfer between the air in your bloodstream. It can help you with clearing secretions, making sure that you are uh, getting assistance with coughing if that's relevant for you. So some of those other respiratory health tasks that you can uh, manage are, are actually just as relevant now. Um, the other thing is when you're coming into flu season, um, looking at not just COVID-19 risk, but also other regular uh, infections that can be putting you in a harmful or vulnerable situation. So making sure that your pneumovax inoculation is up to date or when the flu vaccine comes out, um, make sure that you're, you're accessing these ways of trying to prevent any other vulnerability in your respiratory health. And that's exactly what I was going to say, Rhonda, is to make sure that, that you get your vaccinations in the time okay. comes. Uh, one of the other things I've discussed with a few friends in the community for those of us who use a wheelchair for mobility, either manual or power, is while we're being out and just the risks both to ourselves and to others of picking up germs and carrying germs on a wheelchair that's 
in constant contact with the outside world and that constant contact with push rims and just how much of a factor that actually is and how much risk there is. When it comes to COVID-19 risk, it seems as though the major uh, issue to be worried about are the respiratory droplets. And although the virus can live on solid surfaces, it isn't perhaps as worrisome as the respiratory contact um, in the air. That being said, it still absolutely makes sense to make sure that you're cleaning your push rooms regularly. But the biggest influence is going to be washing your hands. Uh, sometimes people need help with that or it's easier to use the, um, the alcohol rubs, for example, the gels, um, just because it's not always as convenient to find soap and water and taps, especially if you're out in the community. But washing your hands, washing your push rims, washing your joystick, those are all things that are relevant and still really important. Great. And I guess with that in mind, with the droplets and such, uh, wearing masks has been recommended when being outside and being in public. Just wondering if, if there are any negative effects to people with SCI for wearing a mask. That's a great question about wearing masks. I mean, I think wearing, the, the part about wearing masks out, if you're going to be close, and not necessarily even just out in public, but if you're going to be in close quarters with people that aren't part of your bubble, then having people wear masks, having everyone wear masks is a good thing. Um, if you have a spinal cord injury and you have altered respiratory status, if it's difficult for you to breathe with a mask on, then that's obviously an, something to be considered. And you should probably talk to your own physician and talk, you know, talk to your own healthcare provider. For most people with a spinal cord injury, it's still safe to wear a mask. And then it comes, and then there's different types of masks, and often we get asked about that as well. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll show. You. I mean, currently I've got a couple of examples. One that was a homemade one, uh, cloth one that can be washed and reused, and then an N95 mask. I'm just wondering if there is an advantage to either one, or if there's different situations where one or the other is better than the other. Sorry, we certainly heard about PPE uh, shortages in the news. It's been all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, the N95 masks are more important in uh, medical care settings where there are going to be specific procedures done that cause those droplets from the respiratory system to get into the air in a specific way called aerosolization. So in general, it is not necessary for people in the community to be worrying about get, getting N95s. Um, they do have a specific uh, process of being fitted for you, uh, but I think just be reassured that the most practical way to go is a reusable mask that you can wash or some of the uh, disposable ones that don't feel like they're creating that tight seal around your face. The other thing to remember is that if you're using an N95, they are completely useless when you have facial hair for the most part. So they become a why bother? So <laughs> yeah, don't bother. <laughs> all right, good to know. But a mask still want, works. Okay. It doesn't mean don't bother with a mask at all. Right. It yeah. just means that, that really tight fit of an N95 where you're trying to make sure absolutely nothing gets through doesn't work. But I, I think a, a regular mask would still be okay. Yeah. It's still worth using. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> One of the challenges for someone like myself with a C7 injury is limited hand function. Um, fortunately, for the most part, I can get a mask on and off, not, you know, out too much difficulty. But for those with maybe some very limited hand function, are there any other options or masks out there that are easier than others or any tricks or tips for those people? One thing is that if you, if, if it's, if you need help getting your mask on um, and if you're working, if you've got someone who can help you, if you're unable to put your mask on easily yourself and you need someone to help you put your mask on, then I think it's really important to make sure that if, if that somebody who's going to be coming close to you and who isn't part of your bubble to have them have their mask on first and make sure they're washing their hands well. Um, before they help you with your mask and then they can help you with your mask. So that's one option is if you're getting help with your mask. Putting your mask on and off yourself can be really challenging. And one, obviously you can't use your teeth. If you, I know a lot of times um, some of my, some of the people I know who live with spinal cord injury use their mouths and their teeth and we want to avoid, you can't do that with a mask because it's already covering your mouth. 
-hmm. But we also just brings up the point that we want to be careful if you are using your mouth or teeth that you're only doing that on things that are clean um, in general. But may, sometimes you, there's a device, and I think some of the occupational therapists are starting to come up with some things, but I actually haven't come across anything. Rhonda, have you come across anything, anything commercial? Nothing specific for a mask donning device. Yeah. Um, but I think the other thing to be aware of, too, is that once you put on your mask, what you don't want to be doing is this touching it all over the place again. And that's such a common thing. You'll see people pull them down uh, under the bottom of their chin or be readjusting and fiddling. And then all you're doing is you're taking that direct contact from your respiratory droplets and spreading it to the planet. So that is, that's kind of tricky, especially when this is your one area of intact sensation. If you have a high level of injury, it can be really intrusive then to have something covering your neurologically intact face. So um, that's not a contraindication, but it is a recognition that it can be extra painful with that. Um, the other thing is when you're wearing masks for a long time, if you have the kind that the elastic is really tight behind your ears, it hurts or your skin gets grumpy behind there. So there are other devices or um, ear protectors that you can use so that you don't feel like you're constantly at risk for having to adjust or make things less painful. So there's lots of options available for that. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to know that you should have the confidence to ask people around you to follow safety protocols on your own behalf. So if someone is wanting to come for a visit and they don't want to wear a mask, you are absolutely in your rights to require that. And it's important to look after your health and you may be the educator for people around you about what's important to keep you safe. Just last question, I guess for the washable ones, I guess it would be recommended to wash those after every use as well? Yes, that's, that's the recommendation. And to, uh, I, a lot of the washable ones have, have slots to put your own filter in. Um, just to, we, you know, we don't, we, there isn't, we don't know what you should use in, in those slots for the filters, but just to make, remember to take that filter out and uh, if you're wash, when you're washing your mask, because otherwise it'll disintegrate and make a mess. Okay, great. And in line with that, are there any other medical supplies that I should be worried about or stocking up on as we move through this? Well, I think um, one of the things that we've been fortunate in BC is that our flattening of the curve has allowed us to have some of our supply stores, commercial uh, uh, businesses open up again. That is not going to be the case everywhere, and we don't know if that's going to be the case moving forward. So I think as a general principle, there's wisdom to having a consistent supply chain that you're aware of, maybe stocking up on three months worth of catheter supplies, bowel routine supplies, gloves, masks, uh, and even your medications. I agree. Great. I think having three months supply on hand is a really good idea. Just because we don't know if there will be interruptions in the supply chain again. All right. I know for myself early on and when we were on a bit more of a lockdown before things started opening up, I had an unfortunate unplanned trip to the ER. And uh, I definitely you know, debated whether it was worth going in or if I was putting myself more at risk by going in than dealing with what I was already dealing with. In the end, I did go and I felt fairly safe, but are there any suggestions, recommendations, or assurances you have about seeking out medical care, whether in a hospital, doctor's offices, et cetera? The first thing is don't avoid medical care. The last thing we want is people not to get the medical care they need um, during, during this pandemic. So it's really important to get to seek medical care if you feel like you've got something going on. Um, it's fine to reach out if it's not an emergency. It's fine to reach out first by telephone So if you've got your family doctor your primary care provider and you can reach out by telephone or many people are doing video health now It depends where you live here in BC. We're doing a lot of video calls as well as telephone and some things can be dealt with that way but if you need to be seen in person this is, we have put all the precautions in place so that you can come in to see your physicians, your specialists, go to eMERGE um, with safe precautions in place. The other thing to consider is that 
Um, it's easier to manage medical problems earlier on. If you get progressively sick or things get really worrisome, that actually leaves you more vulnerable to other complications. So please don't avoid asking for the um, assistance that you need. Delaying it is um, not beneficial at all. And when you go to the hospital, if there are people who are um, suspected of having the COVID-19 infection, there are protocols in place. So they are not mixed in with the general population in the waiting area. You're not going to be coming into contact with someone who's coughing viral particles all over the place. It's just not going to happen that way. And the cleaning protocols are really well established. The staff are wearing their protective equipment, washing their hands. So um, there's no reason to avoid going to the hospital. And I think the other thing is um, because COVID is such a mimicker uh, in terms of presenting with not only respiratory symptoms, uh, a lot of my patients and my family members and friends, whenever they have any symptom, they have that panic of, oh my goodness, do I have COVID-19? So if you have that concern, it's better to go and ask the question and, and get evaluated rather than making assumptions which can really burn you in the end. Mm -hmm. And we don't know, the one thing we don't know about spinal cord injury is whether, we just haven't had enough experience yet with COVID and spinal cord injury to know if everyone will present in exactly the same way. So the typical symptoms we talk about COVID are fever, dry cough, um, you know, uh, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. But then we've also come to know that there's loss of smell or taste, or um, it can it can present in many different ways. And we don't, as Rhonda said, it is that great mimicker. We don't always know exactly what it's, how it's going to present. So if you think you have any symptoms suggestive of COVID, first of all, go get tested or go get, or get seen, but make sure you're also letting the team know that you think you may have some symptoms so that everyone can take the right precautions for you and with you. Because if you're concerned that you have the infection yourself, the COVID-19 infection, um, it is important and necessary for you to, at that point, immediately quarantine yourself from exposure to anyone else, except for the people who um, may need to be helping you with directive specific personal care. And Andrea's right, letting the staff know of anywhere you're going that you're concerned about that allows them to protect themselves, protect you, and protect the other people around you. Okay. I know we mentioned earlier about you know, stocking up on supplies. And personally, I have someone that I order regularly from and can easily access. And even with my pharmacy, I have delivery set up there. Um, if you are suffering or in pain, are there any other suggestions beyond those couple of things um, to keep yourself in check and, um, and with supplies through this? I think, I, I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about making sure that you connect, you stay connected with your family, friends, and community. And Although that's not a direct, that's not a, you know, it's not a direct um, treatment for pain, it is something that helps, every, that helps your general health. And when you can help your general health and you can stay healthy from a community point of view and from a mental health point of view, I think that's really, really key. So, you know, physically distancing isn't the same as socially distancing. We tend to say social distancing, but what we really mean is physical distancing, trying to keep those six feet apart uh, physically, but trying to remain connected socially. So whether that's, you know, what meeting, we think meeting out, being outside is healthier, and we know that getting outside is good for everyone. So if you can get outside and get a little fresh air and maybe have, you know, get together with a friend, um, in a park or somewhere where you can physically distance safely but still stay connected, I think that's really important. I think one of the things I always were, uh, think about or am concerned about is when you talk about pain management, if there is a change in your symptoms, you always have to ask why now? So if you're experiencing a new kind of pain, it still is really important to do the, the work of figuring out, is there something else that's reversible, modifiable? And that's where you're gonna to need to connect in with uh, your primary health care provider to find out what it is. So what we don't wanna do is end up just saying, well, take more medicines or just have an extra beer or two at night before you go to bed. 
to manage your symptoms. It's like, okay, what is it? How do we change it? How do we get to the root causes rather than just assuming that you need some more medicines to be able to manage? Mm -hmm. And then one other thing that we know works, it does work for pain is exercise. Mm -hmm. So again, it can be difficult to get exercise at the best of times. Um, but if you can stay as active as possible, try to get some exercise, um, get outside. Those are all good techniques. Fresh air therapy. Yeah. <laughs> I think it came up earlier about possibly calling in before making a trip to the ER if you're concerned. Just wondering if um, what other options are out there as far as things like telehealth and some reliable, incredible places to get information on COVID. It seems like there's so much out there. It's, uh, can be challenging to know what to trust and where to trust and or even just where to go to get it. Google can be dangerous. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> so I think you do want to go to reliable evidence-based resources mm -hmm. to answer those questions. So here in British Columbia we have the BC CDC which is the Center for Disease Control. Uh, access their resources. 811 is a phone service here. Every community or every province or state will have uh, reliable evidence-based information to access. And the hope is that you still can be stay, uh, staying connected with your family physician or uh, health clinic. Yeah, I think as Rhonda said that the, if you wanna learn about COVID in general and know what's happening, your Center for Disease Control and your local community, CDC, um, will have the best numbers and will be able to tell you, you'll have a chance to know how many people are being tested, what those positivity rates are in your community. We hear about positivity rates, so how many, what percentage of tests are coming back positive, which gives us a sense of how common COVID is in the community where you're living. Um, we're looking for it to be less than 5%. Right now in BC, it's sitting around 1% to 2%. So, and you, and you also the no, total number of cases. Is that total number of cases staying the same? Is it going up? Is it going down? Hopefully it's going down or staying the same, but ideally going down. Um, and then for other area, things for information, there are some, you know, we've got some great resources such as, such as Skyre, S-C-I-R-E, Skyre Community is a good resource. Um, our spinal cord injury provincial organizations in Canada and Spinal Cord Injury Canada, so those are other, other possible sources um, that have really good evidence-based and reliable information. Great. I think another thing I wanna emphasize is that uh, people sometimes feel like there's a lack of confidence if or when recommendations change because there's that sort of chatter going on of, they didn't tell us the right information at first. The hallmark of scientific process is that as you find out new information, you're able to make the best recommendations. And those recommendations are likely to change as that information grows. So it's not about people you know, making ridiculous recommendations um, at point A versus point B, it's that we're learning and updating because we want the best information um, with the most logical and practical recommend uh, suggestions for how to stay healthy um, in a current sort of fashion. And I, I mentioned when I had to make a trip into the ER and that was locally at Vancouver General Hospital and I did feel fairly safe, but is it reasonable to expect that the standards are the same? Um, at every hospital you're gonna to go to, or can they vary from city to city, province to province, et cetera? I think it's reasonable to expect that they should be similar in every jurisdiction. The only caveat to that is in certain places where the systems are getting overwhelmed, they're doing the best they can. And sometimes that changes how their protocols are working. So it may change where they send people, it may send, change how patients are triaged in terms of location. So it may look different, um, from place to place, but everywhere has protocols, definitely.